book two chapter four part one of love among the artists by george bernard shaw this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter four part one early in the afternoon of the following day which was sunday charlie sutherland presented himself at church street kensington and asked mrs simpson who opened the door if mr jack was within no sir said mrs simpson gravely he is not in just at present on being pressed as to when he would be in mrs simpson became vague and evasive although she expressed sympathy for the evident disappointment of the visitor at last he said he would probably call again and turned disconsolately away he had not gone far when hearing a shout he looked back and saw jack uncombed unshaven in broken slippers and a stained and tattered coat running after him bareheaded come up come back cried jack his brazen tones somewhat forced by loss of breath it's all a mistake that jade come along he seized charlie by the arm and began to drag him back to the house as he spoke the boys of the neighbourhood soon assembled to look with awe at the capture of charlie only a few of the older and less reverent venturing to ridicule the scene by a derisive cheer jack marched his visitor upstairs to a large room which occupied nearly the whole of the first floor a grand pianoforte in the centre was covered with writing materials music in print and manuscript old newspapers and unwashed coffee cups the surrounding carpet was in such a state as to make it appear that periodically when the litter became too cumbrous it was swept away and permitted to lie on the floor just as it chanced to fall the chairs the cushions of which seemed to have been much used as pen wipers were occupied some with heaps of clothes others with books turned inside out to mark the place at which the reader had put them down one with a boot the fellow of which lay in the fender and one with a grimy kettle which had been recently lifted from the fire which in spite of the season burnt in the grate black brown and yellow stains of ink coffee and yolk of egg were on everything in the place sit down said jack impetuously thrusting his former pupil into the one empty chair a comfortable one with elbows shiny with constant use he then sought a seat for himself and in so doing became aware of the presence of mrs simpson who had come in during his absence with the hopeless project of making the room ready for the visitor here he said get some more coffee and some buttered rolls where have you taken all the chairs to i told you not to touch anything in this why what the devil do you mean by putting the kettle down on a chair not likely mr jack said the landlady that i would do such a thing oh dear in one of my yellow chairs too it's too bad you must have done it there was nobody else in the room be off and get the coffee i did not do it said mrs simpson raising her voice and well you know it and i would be thankful to you to make up your mind whether you are to be in or out when people call and not be making a liar of me as you did before this gentleman you are a liar ready-made and a slattern to boot retorted jack look at the state of this room ah said mrs simpson with a sniff look at it indeed i ask your pardon sir she added turning to charlie but what would anybody think of me if they was told that this was my drawing-room jack his attention thus recalled to his guest checked himself on the verge of a fresh outburst and pointed to the door mrs simpson looked at him scornfully but went out without further ado jack then seized a chair by the back shook its contents on to the floor and sat down near charlie i should not have spoken as i did just now he said with compunction let me give you a word of advice charles never live in the house with an untidy woman it must be an awful nuisance mr jack it is sure to lead to bad habits in yourself how is your sister and your father mary is just the same as ever and so is the governor i was with him in birmingham last autumn we heard the prometheus by jove mr jack that is something to listen to the st matthew passion the ninth symphony and the nibelung's ring are the only works that are fit to be put behind it the overture alone is something screeching you like it that's right that's right and what are you doing at present working hard eh the old story mr jack i have failed in everything just as i failed at the music though i stuck to that better than any of the rest whilst i had you to help me 
you began everything too young no matter there is plenty of time yet well well what's the news i'm going to an at home at madge lancaster's the actress you know she made me promise i'd call on my way and mention casually where i was going she thought that you'd perhaps come with me at least i expect that was her game she asked me to come some sunday and i told her i would is this sunday yes mr jack i hope you won't think it cool of me helping her to collar you in this way jack made some inarticulate reply pulled his coat off and began to throw about the clothes which were heaped on the chairs presently he rang the bell furiously and after waiting about twenty seconds for a response went to the door and shouted for mrs simpson in a stunning voice this had no more effect than the bell and he returned muttering execrations to resume his search when he had added considerable to the disorder of the room mrs simpson entered with ostentatious unconcern carrying a tray with coffee and rolls where would you wish me to put these things sir she said with a patient air after looking in vain for a vacant space on the pianoforte what things what do you mean by bringing them who asked you for them you did mr jack perhaps you would like to deny it to this gentleman's face who heard you give the order oh said jack discomfited charles will you take some coffee whilst i am dressing put the tray on the floor if you can't find room for it elsewhere mrs simpson immediately placed it at charlie's feet now said jack looking malignantly at her be so good as to find my coat for me and in future when i leave it in a particular place don't take it away from there yes sir and where did you leave it last if i may make bold to ask i left it on that chair said jack violently do you see on that chair indeed said mrs simpson with open scorn you gave it out to me yesterday to brush and a nice job i have had with it it took a whole bottle of benzine to fetch out the stains it's upstairs in your room and i beg you will be more careful with it in future or else send it to the dyers to be cleaned instead of to me shall i bring it to you no go to the go to the kitchen and hold your tongue charlie i shall be back presently my boy if you will wait and take some coffee put the tray anywhere confound that 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 woman he left the room then and after some time reappeared in a clean shirt and a comparatively respectable black frock coat where does she live he said in the marylebone road her at-homes are great fun her sisters don't consider it proper for a young unmarried woman to give at-homes on her own hook and so they never go i believe they would cut her altogether only they can't afford to because she gives them a new dress occasionally it will be a regular swagger for me to go in with you next to being a celebrity oneself the best thing is to know a celebrity jack only grunted and allowed charlie to talk until they arrived at the house in the marylebone road the door was opened by a girl in a neat dress of dark green with a miniature mob cap on her head i feel half inclined to ask her for a programme and tip her sixpence whispered charlie as they followed her upstairs we may consider that she is conducting us to our stalls mr jack and mr charles sutherland he added aloud to the girl as they reached the landing mr sutherland and mr charles sutherland she answered coldly correcting him jack meanwhile had advanced to where madge stood she wore a dress of pale blue velvet made in venetian style imitated from an old paul veronese round her neck was a threefold string of amber beads and she was shod with slippers of the same hue and material as her dress her complexion skilfully put on did not disgust charlie but rather inspired him with a gentle regret that it was too good to be genuine the arrangement of the rooms was as remarkable as the costume of the hostess the folding doors had been removed and the partition built into an arch with a white pillar at each side a curtain of silvery plush was gathered to one side of this arch the walls were painted a delicate sheeny grey and the carpet resembled a piece of thick whitey brown paper the chairs of unvarnished wood had rush seats or else cushions of dull straw colour or cinnamon in compliance with a freak of fashion which prevailed just then there were no less than eight lamps distributed about the apartments these lamps had monstrous stems of pottery ware gnarled and uncouth in design most of them represented masses of rock with strings of ivy leaves clinging to them the ceiling was of a light maize colour 
magdalen surprised by the announcement of mr sutherland was looking towards the door for him over the head of jack than whom she was nearly a head taller how d'ye do he said startling her with his brassy voice my dear master she exclaimed in the pure distinct tone to which she owed much of her success on the stage so you have come to me at last ay i have come at last he said with a suspicious look i forgot all about you but i was put in mind of your invitation by charles where's charles charles was behind him waiting to be received i am deeply grateful to you said magdalen pressing his hand charles rather embarrassed than gratified replied inarticulately vouched for the health of his family and retreated into the crowd i had ceased to hope that we should ever meet again she said turning again to jack i have sent you box after box that you might see your old pupil in her best parts but when the nights came the boxes were empty always i intended to go i should have gone but somehow i forgot the time or lost the tickets or something my landlady mislays things of that sort or very likely she burns them poor mrs simpson how is she alive and mischievous and long-tongued as ever i must leave that place i can stand her no longer her slovenliness her stupidity and her disregard of truth are beyond belief dear dear i am very sorry to hear that mr jack magdalen turned her eyes upon him with an expression of earnest sympathy which had cost her much study to perfect jack who seldom recollected that the subject of mrs simpson's failings was not so serious to the rest of the world as to himself thought magdalen's concern by no means overstrained and was about to enlarge on his domestic discomfort when the servant announced mr brailsford jack slipped away and his old enemy advanced as sprucely dressed as ever but a little more uncertain in his movements magdalen kissed him with graceful respect as she would have kissed an actor engaged to impersonate her father for so many pounds a week when he passed on and mingled with the crowd like any other visitor she forgot him and looked round for jack but he in spite of his attempt to avoid mr brailsford had just come face to face with him in a remote corner whither chance had led them both jack at once asked him how he did how do you do said the old gentleman with nervous haste glad to i am sure here he found his eyeglass and was unable to distinguish jack's features sir said jack i am an ill-mannered man on occasion but perhaps you will overlook that and allow me to claim your acquaintance sir replied brailsford tremulously clasping his proffered hand i have always honoured and admired men of genius and protested against the infamous oppression to which the world subjects them you may count upon me always there was a time said jack with a glance at the maize-coloured ceiling when neither of us would have believed that we should come to make two in a crowd of fashionable celebrities sitting round her footstool she has made a proud position for herself certainly thanks as she always acknowledges above all things to your guidance hm, said jack doubtfully i taught her to make the best of such vowels as there are left in our spoken language but her furniture and her receptions are her own idea they are the most ridiculous absurdities in london whispered brailsford with sudden warmth to you sir i express my opinion without reserve i come here because my presence may give a certain tone a sanction you understand me jack nodded but i do not approve of such entertainments i am at a loss to comprehend how the actress can so far forget the lady this room is not respectable mr jack it is an outrage on taste and sensibility however it is not my choice it is here and de gustibus non est disputandum you will excuse my quoting my old school books i never did so sir in my youth when every fool's mouth was full of scraps of latin there is a bad side to this sort of thing said jack these fellows waste their time coming here and she wastes her money on extravagancies for them to talk about but after all there is a bad side to everything she might indulge herself with worse follies now that she is her own mistress we must all stand further off her affairs are not our business the old gentleman nodded several times in a melancholy manner there you have hit the truth sir he said in a low voice we must all stand further off i as well as others a very just observation this dialogue exceptionally long for a crowded afternoon reception in london was interrupted by magdalen coming to invite jack to play 
which he peremptorily refused to do remarking that if the company were in a humour to listen to music they had better go to church the rebuff created much disappointment for jack's appearances in society common as they had been during the season which preceded the first performance of prometheus had since been very rare stories of his eccentricity and inaccessible solitude had passed from mouth to mouth until they had become too stale to amuse or too exaggerated to be believed his refusal to play was considered so characteristic that some of the guests withdrew at once in order that they might be the first to narrate the circumstances in artistic circles which are more at home on sundays than those of the more purely fashionable class which has nothing particular to do on weekdays jack was about to go himself when the blue velvet sleeve touched his arm and magdalen whispered they will all go in a very few minutes now will you stay and let me have a moment with you alone it is so long since i have had a word of advice from you jack again looked suspiciously at her but as she looked very pretty he relented saying good-humouredly get rid of them quickly then i have no time to waste waiting for them she set herself to get rid of them as well as she could by pretending to mistake the purpose of men who came up to converse with her and surprising them with effusive farewells to certain guests with whom she did not stand on ceremony she confided her desire to clear the room and they immediately conveyed her wishes to their intimate friends besides setting an example to others by taking leave ostentatiously or declaring in loud whispers that it was shamefully late that dear madge must be tired to death and that they were full of remorse at having been induced by her delightful hospitality to stay so long in fifteen minutes the company was reduced to five or six persons who seemed to think now that the crowd was over that the time had come for enjoying themselves a few of them who knew each other relaxed their ceremonious bearing raised their voices and entered into a discussion on theatrical topics in which they evidently expected magdalen to join the rest wandered about the rooms and made the most of their opportunity of having a good look at the great actress and the great composer who was standing at a window with his hands clasped behind him frowning unapproachably mr brailsford also remained and he was the first to notice the air of exhaustion with which his daughter was mutely appealing to her superfluous guests my child he said are you fatigued i am worn out she replied in a whisper which reached to the furthest corner of the room how i long to be alone why did you not tell me so before said brailsford offended i shall not trouble you any longer magdalen good evening hush she said laying her arm caressingly on his and speaking this time in a real whisper i meant that for the others i want you to do something for me mr jack is waiting to go with you and i particularly want to speak to him alone about a pupil could you slip away without his seeing you do dear old daddy for i may never have another chance of catching him in a good humour magdalen knew that her father would be jealous of having to leave before jack unless she could contrive to make him do so of his own accord the stratagem succeeded mr brailsford left the room with precaution glancing apprehensively at the musician who still presented a stolid back view to the company the group of talkers warned by madge's penetrating whisper submissively followed him leaving only one young man who was anxious to go and did not know how to do it she relieved him by giving him her hand and expressing a hope that she should see him next sunday he promised earnestly and departed now said jack wheeling round the instant the door closed what can i do for you your few minutes have spun themselves out to twenty did they seem so very long she said seating herself upon an ottoman and throwing her dress into graceful folds yes said jack bluntly so they did to me won't you sit down jack pushed an oaken stool opposite to her with his foot and sat upon it much as in a scandinavian story a dwarf might have sat at the feet of a princess well mistress he said things have changed since i taught you eh some things have you have become great and so in my small way have i i have become what you call great she said but you have not changed people have found out your greatness that is all well said said jack approvingly they starved me long enough first damn them used i to swear at you when i was teaching you i think you used to just a little when i was very dull 
it is a bad habit a stupid one as all low habits are i rarely fall into it and so you stuck to your work and fought your way that was right are you as fond of the stage as ever it is my profession said madge with a disparaging shrug one's profession is only half of one's life acting in london where the same play runs for a whole season leaves one time to think of other things sundays at home and fine furniture for instance things that they vainly pretend to supply i have told you that my profession is only half my life the public half now that i have established that firmly i begin to find that the private and personal half the half which is concerned with home and and domestic ties must be well established too or else the life remains incomplete and the heart unsatisfied in plain english you have too much leisure which you can employ no better than in grumbling oh, perhaps so but am i much at fault when i entered upon my profession its difficulties so filled my mind with hopes and fears and its actual work so fully occupied my time that i forgot every other consideration and cut myself off from my family and friends with as little hesitation as a child might feel in exchanging an estate for a plaything now that the difficulties are overcome the hopes fulfilled or abandoned and the fears dispelled now that i find that my profession does not suffice to fill my life and that i have not only time but desire for other interests i find how thoughtless i was when i ran away from all the affection i had unwittingly gathered to myself as i grew why what have you lost you have your family still i am as completely estranged from them by my profession as if it had transported me to another world i doubt if they are any great loss to you the public are fond of you ain't they they pay me to please them if i disappeared they would forget me in a week why shouldn't they how long do you think they should wear mourning for you have you made no friends in your own way of life friends yes i suppose so you suppose so what is the matter then what more do you want magdalen raised her eyelids for an instant and looked at him then she said nothing and let the lids fall with the cadence of her voice end of chapter four part one recording by expatriate in bangor maine